I am Games, and these are Opinions. Neo is a terrifying game. Not so much because of the stupidly steep challenge it presents, most people go in knowing this game is designed to murder you constantly, but the real terrifying aspect of Neo is the bulk of skill points, systems, statistics, and mechanics the game throws your way and expects you to master. This is not just Dark Souls with a coat of weeaboo paint thrown on top. Neo gives you no shortage of options when it comes to min-maxing your character. But the problem is that not only are there arguably too many systems at play, but that the bulk of them seem to have far too little impact on your character to justify the time sifting through all of them. Or at least the structure of the game makes it feel that way. Allow me to explain. Much like the majority of the Souls-like genre, Neo has a flexible leveling system that allows for soft class creation. At the heart of Neo's gameplay loop is Amarita, a crystal that contains immense power. In the game, Amarita can be found scattered throughout the world, hidden in chests and other breakable objects, or as rewards for completing missions, but it's primarily obtained by killing enemies. You can then visit one of the many shrines in each level that doubles as a checkpoint, and spend your Amarita on leveling up your character. Your effectiveness in combat is split into a handful of different attributes, and improving a single stat of your character constitutes a new level, allowing you to customize your build and focus on specific styles of play. Managing this resource is crucial, since dying means dropping all the Amarita you've collected so far, and dying again without retrieving it where you died causes you to lose that pool permanently. So far, so Dark Souls. However, Neo goes far harder on giving you options. Unlike Souls, where the bulk of a weapon's effectiveness scales by pumping points into either strength or dexterity, Neo instead gives every weapon group a buff based on a separate stat. So while leveling strength will increase your proficiency with axes, it only improves axes. If you want to improve your effectiveness with katanas, that requires leveling up heart. Dexterity buffs dual katanas, etc, etc. This means that choosing a preferred weapon type early benefits your build, as you can stack points into a single attribute that will boost your preferred weapon type exclusively. But this also cuts down on potential experimentation, since unlike Souls, where you can play around with a whole range of weapon types under the strength dex dichotomy, in Neo, going outside your single spec weapon type means you're at a disadvantage. In addition to raw stats though, each weapon has its own familiarity rating, representing how much you've used that particular weapon. The more you use a specific weapon in combat, the more this rank increases, and its effectiveness improves on top of the base numbers. This is a pretty neat system in and of itself, and it rewards the player for finding a favorite that they really like, and seems to work well with the single spec incentives already at play. However, when added into the other systems at work, this can quickly become confusing. Weapon acquisition in Neo doesn't follow the Dark Souls formula, instead working much more like a dungeon crawler in the vein of Diablo. Nearly every enemy in the game drops loot of some kind, and all the loot is randomly generated, which means every sword, every bow, and every piece of armor in the game has the potential for different effects, even if you have 20 duplicates of the same item. This is exasperated even further by pulling over Diablo's rarity system, where different colors of items represent increasing rarity, and consequently, more power. From what I can tell, almost every item in the game can be acquired at every rarity, and combined with the RNG nature of buffs and effects means that the possibilities are essentially endless, and that's not even touching on things like armor set bonuses. Min-maxing in Neo is a game in and of itself, and it's as impressive as it is daunting. Now, all of this is fantastic for the more meticulous among us, but I found that after about a dozen hours, the constant cycling of new items constituted a bit more of my total game time than I would have preferred. And now, sitting at over 60 hours of play, I can safely say that item management in Neo can become a chore to all but the most enthused. The rate at which you pick up new items is staggeringly high, so you'll always want to jump into the menu and stack up what you just picked up against what you already have. You'll quickly end up with dozens if not hundreds of different items to cycle through and compare, and not just simple stats like attack and defense value but loads of extra buffs and bonus effects. Do you want to use the axe that has a higher base damage and adds 7% fire damage, or the one with slightly less attack but reduces key usage and gives you an extra 12% guard break while in mid-stance? You'll find yourself asking questions like this constantly, and since you're always just a handful of minutes away from the next significant drop, it's almost impossible to settle into a loadout unless you decide to largely ignore this aspect of the game. Ignoring loot is hard to do though, since it's the main method of progression. There's nothing really analogous to Titanite in Neo, so you can't keep buffing your favorite weapon to keep it effective long term. Well, that's not entirely true. Neo has a weapon upgrade system, but as you would expect in a game as dense with choice as this one, it's much more nuanced in its implementation. Between missions, you can visit the blacksmith that travels with you and, among other things, soul match your weapons. This allows you to take low-level weapons and armor and increase their effectiveness by sacrificing a higher-level piece of gear. The higher the level of the sacrificed gear compared to the receiving item, the more powerful the buff. Usually. You see, it's not always that straightforward. 
As I mentioned before, almost any item worth using in Neo has additional effects beyond their base damage, and these effects are also tweaked by soul matching, but the effect isn't always positive. Sometimes we get a nice boost to damage with a soul match, but could reduce the potency of the weapon's buffs, which on its own could be considered a fair trade-off, but in this scenario, it kind of defeats the entire purpose, since those buffs are the only reason you'd want to hold onto that piece of gear in the first place. Mercifully, the game shows you what the effects of a soul match will be before you commit to the upgrade, so you can at least make an informed decision. I realize this might sound a little complex, so allow me to give you a tangible example. In the beginning of my playthrough, I found a blue bandit axe that, among other things, reduced key usage in high stance by 14%, as well as increasing guard break in high stance by 19%. It was a stupidly good combination and crushed early game, but eventually the raw damage began to fall behind other weapons. So I went to soul match it, and while the damage increased, both stats I mentioned dropped by 4 and 6% respectively, no matter what item I chose to use for the soul match. At that point, I had other axes that already did more damage and had similar buffs with percentages in that range, so I eventually just dumped the bandit axe for something new and saved myself the pile of gold for other things. Oh, did I forget to mention? Amarita doesn't double as money like in Souls, Neo instead giving you another currency to juggle. Soul matching your weapon and entire armor sets even once can cost an absorbent amount of gold though, and I found myself further disincentivized to bother with the mechanic since in the time it would take me to farm the gold I'd need for a soul match, I'd most likely stumble upon better weapons in the interim. Something that was really nice about the upgrading in Soulsborne was that the cost in Souls to imbue weapons with Titanite was largely inconsequential. Since Titanite was a separate resource dedicated solely to improving gear, actually finding the Titanite in the first place made up for the bulk of the cost for the improvement. This made gear upgrades simple and approachable for the player, while also incentivizing them to explore the world more carefully. Neo doesn't have a connected world, and its drops are largely randomized, so it turns all your mountains of RNG loot into its version of Titanite. But the resulting system lacks the elegance of FromSoft's approach, and all but tells you to just head back out there and grind more loot instead. Now, I'm sure someone in the comments right now is writing up a furious response on how I'm an idiot, and soul matching is actually completely logical and there's a system behind controlling the buffs debuffs to weapon effects, or that I just didn't level the blacksmith up enough. Yeah, the blacksmith can be upgraded too. And actually, while researching for this script, I stumbled upon a comment from a wiki that said the reason the numbers look like they're going down from a soul match is that soul matching resets your weapon's familiarity rating that I mentioned earlier, and that causes the drop. Maxing out the familiarity again for more use will bring the stats back up to normal. The fact that this wasn't apparent to me even 60 hours deep into the game kinda solidifies my entire point here. It's not that Neo systems aren't logical, it's that they're so overly dense that they may be doing more harm than good. On this very same wiki page, there were comments correcting and adding to the article referring to familiarity, which just stated higher familiarity lets you offer the items at a shrine for more Amarita, which threw me for a loop because I knew for sure that wasn't the case. If a wiki dedicated entirely to a single game has conflicting information on just one of the cornucopia of systems available in its own game, perhaps that's a sign of a problem. Throwing all these systems at the player makes for a lot of options, but paradox of choice quickly settles in for all but the most hardcore. This says nothing of the fact that very few of these systems are adequately explained in game to even let you know how they all worked, as evidenced by the above examples. I know Digi in his playthrough just went for the biggest attack value and ignored everything else, but in my experience, the raw attack and defense are actually the least useful attributes, and the buffs are way more effective going into mid game, so Neo expects you to use them. That being said, all this time and hassle would be worth it if you actually ended up feeling like the time invested rewarded you with some significant results. But it's here, where all of Neo's systems arguably need to be the most potent, that the game falls flat the hardest, and the nature of the mission structure does the most damage. Perhaps I'm just terrible at character building, but it seems to me that no matter how much time I spent min-maxing, how good of gear I got, or how many skill points I spent, William never seems to become any more effective than he was in the beginning of the game. Sure, the numbers go up, and if that's all it takes to satisfy you, then fantastic. But in terms of practical changes to the gameplay, nothing ever really feels like it's improving as you supposedly get stronger. You see, most games run into this issue when it comes to implementing a leveling system. Your avatar gains strength, but if the rest of the game doesn't rise to meet you, there's no more challenge. But if the game moves in lockstep with your character, the effort you're putting in becomes largely pointless, as there's no appreciable difference. The systems are just there to facilitate bigger numbers, and the developers hope you don't really think about it too much. Soulsborne, and especially Dark Souls 1, counters this issue incredibly well with its looping, interconnected map design. Enemies in Dark Souls 1 are scaled to the area they're in. They don't increase in strength with you. Since you're always moving around and revisiting areas you've been to before, even if it's just on your way to another new location you've yet to get to, you'll inevitably spar with enemies you've had trouble with early on at a later point and find they're now utterly trivial. 
A great example in Dark Souls 1 is the graveyard outside Firelink Shrine leading to the catacombs. Right from the beginning of the game, you can go to this area, and while it's not impossible to hold your own against the skeletons scattered throughout, they'll easily punish you with every mistake, and it's this way on purpose. It's FromSoft's way of telling you they want you to not go left towards the catacombs, but to your right, up towards Undead Berg. Because we flew in here, right? So, we haven't been like any of the directions. Oh yo, what up? What's up, dude? This is more like it. Fast forward a dozen hours after getting the Lord Vessel and having to come back here to the catacombs and kill Nito, and these same skeletons are now able to be utterly decimated by your now far stronger, better geared character. Oh right, I forgot about the skeletons. I probably like one-shot these guys though. <laughs> it's a small part of the game, but it really helps solidify the feeling of legitimate progression, justifying all the time spent collecting souls and searching for Titanite to upgrade your gear. Something that started off as a challenge is just now a minor concern at worst, and I distinctly remember the feeling of pure catharsis as I tore through the enemies that had given me so much grief in the beginning of the game. As stated before, Neo has no connected world, instead using a mission structure, so it can't emulate this feeling of progression. In the beginning of the game with the starting weapons and no armor, William will very easily die, taking no more than 2-3 to three hits from even the most basic zombie skeletons to go down. Fast forward to 60 hours later in the game, and the endgame missions are still recycling the same skeleton zombie models, scaled up in damage and health, and just like in the first 60 minutes of the game, they kill William in 2-3 to three hits, and take the same amount of hits from your super stack soul match weapons to take down. As a result, gearing and leveling in Neo never really feels like you're getting any stronger. Instead, it just kind of feels like you're keeping up with everything else around you. And maybe that's the point, but it kind of nullifies any satisfaction you get from all the time invested interacting with all these systems, when in practice, they do fuck all. You never get a moment in Neo like you do in Dark Souls going back to that graveyard. Your increase in strength is only in the numbers that pop up with each hit. It's all empty avatar strength. None of it amounts to anything truly tangible. This feeling of empty progression is reinforced by other smaller details as well. One simple example that I noticed playing some more Neo for this video back to back with Bloodborne is that in Bloodborne, and other FromSoft games, your HP and stamina meters start off really small, but as you pour more points into vitality and endurance, those bars slowly get larger, giving you a tangible, visual cue for your character's improvement as the game progresses. On the other hand, Neo's health and key meters remain static, and without digging into the menus to toggle on showing numerical values, there's no obvious visual to show your improvement long term. Now, this aspect of Neo is unfortunate, but it can still be seen as a rather subjective contention. Sure, it contributes to a feeling of empty strength, but that might not be something that bothers you. However, there is another example of this that's a fair bit more concrete, and as a result, a bit more difficult to shrug off. I first noticed this issue completely by accident. About a dozen hours or so into the game, I hit my first major difficulty spike against a boss called the Warrior of the West. The fight itself was fairly simple, beat up another samurai in a field, but this guy was just punishing far more aggressive than any boss in the game so far, and that's saying something considering the already insanely high difficulty of Neo, even compared to its peers in the genre. Like basically every enemy in the game, the Warrior of the West is able to kill William in an instant, three hits at most being enough to take you out. I threw myself against this boss dozens of times over the course of about three days, constantly switching gear, going back out to other missions to replay them to try and farm better armor to prevent some of the damage I was taking, but nothing I tried seemed to work. All this extra armor was causing me additional problems though. Like Souls, equipment in Neo has weight, and the closer you get to your equip load, the slower you move. Unlike Souls though, which expresses encumbrance via a few different roll states, Neo's equip load is far more granular, each 10% or so subtly slowing you down even more. Not only that, but stamina cost for everything increases as you move closer to your equip load, meaning better defense essentially costs you both offensive options and maneuverability. In this situation though, I figured it was a cost worth taking to try and save myself from getting too shotted, but after continuing to get my ass handed to me, it was time for a new strategy. I unequipped all my armor for shits and giggles, assuming that, well now I'd assuredly die in merely one hit across the board, I'll be able to move a lot faster and hit harder without worrying about managing stamina as much. Imagine my surprise then, when despite dropping over 200 points in defense, I still took around the exact same amount of damage naked that I was wearing heavier armor. Even now, 60 hours in with much more powerful armor than I had during that fight, every time I experiment taking off my armor to fall back on agility, I can't notice an appreciable difference in damage taken, but do notice a large uptick in stamina conservation. 
This is still all feelings though, so I decided to put it to the test. I captured some footage so I could accurately compare damage taken with and without armor from the same enemy via the same attack. The difference in damage can then show definitively the effectiveness of at least my particular set of armor in Neo. I've also made sure to not have a Guardian Spirit equipped, so the only defensive buffs come from the armor alone. In this first clip, I'm wearing armor. When taking the overhead attack from this Oni Demon guy, I take 1,801 points of damage from a single hit from a common enemy. Neo is fucking hard, guys. Going back to the same enemy unarmored, this hit actually overkills me, doing 2,573 damage. Comparing the damage shows that the armor set prevents just under 33% of damage taken in this example. So, thankfully, armor in Neo isn't completely useless, at least later into the game where basic enemies can one-shot you. But 33% isn't a titanic difference. Plus, during the bulk of your gameplay, you probably would have a Guardian Spirit equipped, which would help close the gap a bit and could shave the percentage down at least a few points points depending on the spirit used. I'd expect a number like this to be the difference between a light armor set and a heavy one, not armored to naked, but that's just my opinion, so take it as you will. I think probably the more valuable piece of information here though is that even with armor, a single hit from a common enemy can do over 80% of your life bar in damage. When you combine this with elixirs, Neo's version of Estus, being a collectible you pick up from the world and not tied to respawns, it makes damage reduction from gear even more important, since you can't always reliably have your max amount of elixirs on you. When you're out of stock, you only gain 3 when respawning from a shrine, and farming for more is rather difficult because they aren't a common drop like Blood Vials and Bloodborne, for instance. Unless you found all the Kodamas in the area that grant you a bonus that gives you a 25% increased chance of enemies dropping Elixir, in yet another example of Neo adding needless complexity. Three Elixirs don't mean much, though, when they can't even regen the amount of health lost from the single attack in the previous example. Which means your base Elixirs can cover at best around three heavy hits and maybe five to seven lesser attacks. Now, the natural response to a piece of criticism like this is probably, Tom, this is a weak point to make. It's a Souls-like. These games put far more emphasis on positioning, dodging, and blocking than soaking up damage with armor values. Armor only really mattered in Dark Souls 1, and even that wasn't a band-aid for poor play. Dark Souls 3 and Bloodborne are referred to as fashion souls because the armor largely was reduced to aesthetic flair over any real gameplay value in the majority of cases. Why treat Neo any differently? And you'd be absolutely right, in those games. Dark Souls 1 only had a handful of armor sets, and while they can be upgraded, the system is pretty basic, and will probably be largely treated as an afterthought since you only have so much Titanite, and improving your weapons has a much greater impact on your effectiveness. Dark Souls 3 and Bloodborne don't even have armor upgrading. Armor is much less relevant to the gameplay. This is Neo, though, and as I explained earlier, there are a ton of systems in play dedicated to assessing, enhancing, comparing, and buffing the mountains of armor sets that the game constantly throws at you from start to finish. The entire conceit of the game is engaging with all these multi-layered systems that demand so much of your in-game resources and real-life time, to then deliver this little of a payoff. It speaks to a central gameplay conceit that is questionably balanced. At this point, why even have all these systems in the first place? Why spend all the time trying to collect armor sets with stacking buffs and then soul matching them to increase their stats if running around in my loincloth is in the same ballpark of effectiveness but with the added benefit of being faster on top of it, in a game that's all about positioning? Why spend all this time collecting loot and upgrading my weapons if the game's design never lets me feel like I'm getting any stronger? Why not just have skill points for acquiring new weapon arts, ninja arts, and amyo magic, since those are the only things that have an appreciable effect on gameplay because they give William new skills to use in combat, not just bigger numbers? More isn't always better. I know I just spent like six pages ragging on Neo, but I do still really like the game. It was the first Souls-like game that I really got into, but on the other side of playing Bloodborne, Dark Souls, and Dark Souls 3, these issues really stood out to me returning to this game. Which is a real shame because the game does a lot really well. The multiple stances and weapon arts adding tons of extra depth to the combat on top of the standard light and heavy attacks and souls, key pulsing to let you better manage stamina and keep you in the fray longer, ranged weapons being way more viable from the get-go, able to do massive damage with headshots, the raw visual catharsis 
just from every hit in the game, especially being able to cleave additional limbs off of corpses as they go through their death animation, letting you get that little extra fuck you to a particularly challenging enemy when you finally conquer it. The living weapon system is fantastic for clutch moments, giving you a small window of invulnerability and extra damage, essentially dropping a devil trigger system into the souls formula. Tying it to Amarita was a stroke of genius too, letting you spend crystals of it mid-fight to refill the living weapon gauge faster at the risk of adding more potential Amrita to the pool to lose if you die. There's just a lot going on in Neo, as I said at the top, and while so much of it is rewarding and cathartic, there's also a lot that just feels unsubstantial when examined a bit more closely. And it's just a shame that the systems that fall prey to this the most are also the ones that are the most forward-facing and invalidate a fair portion of the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. I'll probably finish Neo someday, but the fact that I have to spend so much time engaging with systems that don't give any appreciable feedback to using them means the day that I actually do end up beating this game is a fair bit further off than I otherwise would have liked. Hey, thanks for making it to the end of the video. As much as I may have been critical of Neo in this video, I owe it a lot of thanks. I had ignored the Souls series for years ever since a poor first experience with Dark Souls 1 back in 2012, simply because I had little interest in grinding through overly difficult games. We decided to stream Neo for the channel last year though because it was made by Team Ninja, who made Ninja Gaiden, one of my favorite games, while being Souls-like, one of Digi's favorite genres. So we wanted to see if there was any overlap between our tastes there. I pushed myself through it and eventually tried Bloodborne and totally fell in love with it as a result. And the much more forgiving difficulty curve in that game, at least compared to Neo, allowed me to give it the fair shake it deserved and eventually go back to Dark Souls 1 and complete it. Souls has this reputation of brutal uphill challenge, and while I won't say it isn't deserved, it is a bit overblown. To me, Neo represents an actual game that lives up to the reputations that the Souls games have in popular discourse. In addition to working on this channel, I'm also making a game of my own, which you can check out the demo of over on Newgrounds. If you like these videos, or the game, I'd love if you could throw me a buck a month over on Patreon so I can keep these videos coming at least once a week, and spend as much time as possible continuing to develop the game and learn more 3D animation and programming. And if you donate $5 a month, you get access to a weekly bonus podcast that I make just for patrons. That's all I got for now. Until next time, remember to be the games you want to see. I am Games, signing out.